So my name is Bana. My name is Tanisha. And we're here because Black, Black women, women Matter! matter. Thank you all for being here. I want to give you a brief backstory of um, the work that went into organizing this memorial. So in early May 2015, a group of cisgender and transgender Black women who live, work, play, and struggle in Seattle decided to create an accessible space for mourning state violence and police terrorism against our own. While it is our duty to fight for all black lives, we envision a, mo a movement that prioritizes black women and girls alongside black men and boys. Our bodies are tired and our trauma is fresh. Therefore, we decided to convene a memorial honoring the lives of black women impacted by and lost to state violence. An event free from competing Free from competing with opportunistic white voices, harming, harming our bodies and minds, or risking arrest in the streets. Our Black Women Matter, or hashtag, Black Women Matter Memorial is a part of a National Day of Action to End State Violence Against Black Women and Girls. We uplift the names and stories of women erased by patriarchy and respectability politics like Maya Hall, a transgender sex worker killed by police in Baltimore just a few weeks before the murder of Freddie Gray. We will also express our solidarity with black women survivors of state violence in our own backyard and beyond, such as Mieko Coco Durden Bosley, whose eye socket was broken by a police, Seattle police officer last year. We hope the, memor the memorial serves as a space not only for grieving, but also community building so we can begin the crucial work of transforming and dismantling institutions that make Seattle unsafe and unwelcoming for all black women. Tonight, we will, we will hear stories, poetry, song, and live music by black women for black women. We will also speak the names of black women harmed by state violence during a candle lighting ceremony. Please respect the performers, speakers, and each other. Feel free to visit the altar during the intermission. Um, it's honoring black women lost to state violence and black women survivors of state violence during the memorial. For those of you using social media, please use the hashtag Black Woman Matter, woman with an X, because we want to be inclusive of all women. Um, also, we have water down here, um, so feel free to help yourself to that. Uh, before we begin, the organizing committee of this memorial wants to acknowledge that we are currently on native land stolen by white settlers. We stand in solidarity with indigenous people who continue to resist their colonizers and protect their land. So, um, without further ado, we're going to start with some stories of, of black women um, who, who have been victims of state violence and survived state violence. Um, first, we're going to have Salam Abunu and Isla Barber. Hello, Maya Hall, say her name. Maya Hall was a sweet girl, a jokester. She was kind, but the others stayed with her when she had a motel. Oh, sorry. She enjoyed dressing up. She was brave. Maya was a transgender woman. Did sex work on the streets in Baltimore. And although she faced many dangers in her work, her life was taken after a simple mistake with fatal consequences. On March 30th, 2015, Maya and a friend were driving and they safely took a wrong exit, which was enough to cause which was enough cause for police to unload rounds of bullets into the vehicle, killing Maya and injuring her friend. A wrong turn is never just cause for death of another black person. But like other trans women of color, Maya's murder failed to garner the type of nationwide attention paid to other unjust murders of black people. Maya was transgendered, misgendered by police and media alike, and it was she who stood trial in the courts of public opinion and respectable politics. Like a Baltimore area trans advocate said about Maya, she had a hard life. She, was, she just wanted to have a job, a life, a home, just the simple things. So, we honor Maya and all the trans sisters who lives, whose lives are easily lost and forgotten. And we vow to celebrate her spirit. Jenkins, the transgender advocate, said she met Hall briefly about two years ago when she worked with the group passing out condoms. 
I'm trying to help other prostitutes with housing and legal matters. Chuck. Rakia Boyd, say your name. Rakia Boyd. Rakia Boyd would have been 25 today. Three years ago, when she, fatally, when she was fatally shot in Chicago, Illinois, by Dante Sumat, an off-duty Chicago police detective, servant fired multiple shots from an unregistered firearm from his car over his shoulder, his shoulder into a crowd of people. One bullet hit Boyd's friend, Antonio Cross, in the hand. Another hit Boyd in the back of the head. Like some sources reported, Boyd was no super. She was living in a black woman, a human being, shot dead for no other reason than supposedly a parent's suspicious. Her 22-year-old life was cut short because she was a black in a world that saw and still sees her body as a weapon, and she was forgotten by a society that thinks of women last. Her murderer, the Chicago police detective, was eventually charged with voluntary manslaughter for this year, April 20th, 2015, after years of documented evidence and public fighting against a state-sponsored police war on black and brown people. Rakia's murder was cleared of all charges. Rakia Boyd's brother, Martin, Mar Martinez Sutton, had this to say when that pick was cleared. Man, I just lost it. I lost it, man. Because they took the whole thing as a joke. I felt like my sister was guilty of dying. He stood up in the courtroom and shouted, Want me to be quiet? This motherfucker killed my sister. Today, for Rakia, Maya, Ayana, Tanisha, and all the black girls, we will not be quiet. Ashe. Ashe. Okay, next up we're going to have Emme Josiane Ingabere. Love in the hood as if to say, 
thank you kindly for the blessings of being black. As if to say thank you for the boldness to be black in this or any zip code in this world. But God does not live in the 30310. And come next Sunday, we will still be at war. So what, so what is it going to be when reality only gives you so many options to save your child? Like, kill a cop for mine, save a child. Tell me it's not true. Kill a cop, you might save a child. Okay? Kill a cop, you might save a child. Thank you, M.A. Next we have Marsha P. Sorry, Justina. Justine, I'm so sorry. Justine, please come. Marsha P. Johnson, say her name. Marsha P. Johnson. Marsha P. Johnson was born and raised in New York City. She identified as a transvestite a term many trans people used before the 1980s, before inclusive language existed, for trans and gender, gender non-conforming people. A survivor of child abuse and not being accepted at home, she spent her days mostly homeless on the streets of New York City. Eventually, she would stay with a close friend from the gay community. During that time, she supported herself through sex work. The P in her name stood for pay it no mind. She frequented gay bars and performed as a drag queen. Many gay bars, however, discriminated against trans people. Even the Stonewall Inn allowed her to be one of the few trans people to perform there. On June 28, 1969, during a homophobic and transphobic police raid, Johnson decided to fight back against the police with her friend Celia Rivera. They started a major riot against the police. The incident would lead to the official beginning of the gay rights movement. It would be remembered as Christopher Street Day. Marsha's activism did not end with the Stonewall Riots. She fought for gay liberation, a term that once was inclusive of trans people, intersex people, gender non-conforming people, gay men, lesbians, and bisexuals. She worked closely with the Gay Liberation Front as well. After occupying Weinstein Hall at New York University to protest his homophobic policies, she co-founded STAR, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, along with Celia Rivera. Her work with STAR included outreach to trans sex workers, outreach to homeless youth, and organizing protests. Her accomplishments for queer trans people are many. She was one of the first organizers of the, Christ of the Christopher Street Day Liberation Marches, which would later become known as the Pride Parades. STAR was believed to be the first to offer shelter specifically to homeless trans and queer youth. Fighting for better medical treatment for those surviving HIV and AIDS was another one of her missions after she was diagnosed with AIDS. Her uh, Marsha P. Johnson continued her work until she was found dead in the Hudson River in 1992. The circumstances of her death are still a matter of debate. Unfortunately, her fate was not uncommon for many trans people of color. Her efforts have led to the advancement of every queer and trans person in the United States regardless of race. Asha. Asha. Thank you, Justine. Next up, we have Infinity. How you guys doing tonight?
and eventually choking one of the young men. Although bystanders later jumped in to help and defend these women and separate them from the attacker of the group, Although bystanders later jumped in to help defend these women and separate the attacker from the group, these seven women, Patrice Johnson, Renita Hill, Benice Brown, Terrain Dandridge, Chanice Loyal, Lania Daniel, and Kamisha Coates were demonized in the news and attacked and accused of attacking the man simply because he was straight. As Renita Hill later said, it felt as though they were being punished for wanting to live and not be harmed and violated. Four of the seven women were eventually imprisoned for defending themselves against threats of rape and other violence. This was another example of the state sending a clear message to lesbian and queer black women that our survival is no value to those in power. But the reality is that the survival is our right as black women and we will defend our lives as long as we live. Thank you so much, Georgina. Next up, we're gonna have a piece by Nikita Oliver. Do you see the boy in the corner? The one with the bluest eyes. How he carries well-intentioned honesty like a badge, how entitlement wears his shoulders like a mantle and privilege holds his hand, how he speaks to the class like a king, how he looks at me, black woman like target practice, fires off, Nikita, I'm just being honest, but when you say black women's lives matter, I feel like you're taking something from me. I feel like you're calling me racist. I feel like he trails off with hesitation. The room cannot hear him, but I can feel his words. There are a pulse on the nation's vein. He's not the only one who thinks like this. He continues, you make me feel guilty for being white. But I didn't shoot the boy in the corner. I don't want his blood on my hands. This is not my way to carry. See, suddenly his words hit me. I am shell-shocked rubble, heavy with the prayers of ancestors and uttered sounds that I need 
to understand I am slave ship, chattel and parcel thrown overboard when my flesh cannot complete the journey. I am stolen, mouth that cannot speak my mother tongue. I would tell you my story, but history is not mine when I am still property. Auction block and runaway slave. I am sharecrop land stolen by genocide and broken treaty. I am prisoner of war. I am black boy blood on pavement. Black girl face down in dirt. Black trans woman skirt, shirt torn. I am exposed, I am hands up, please. Do not shoot us while we are carrying our children through underground railroads. I am fist broke power. Black beauty and Soma sun heat beat down on pain with hope that we can march again and again and again, that we will march again and again and again. Each time they tell us, give it time and time, things will change. So we march again and again and again until our souls bleed and our throats go raw with chanting until I cannot control this riot in my skin. Cause waiting burns like pepper spray, like blunt object, like police baton shoved in my face as a tired beast of a mask showing you just how much I need to be free of the spirit to respond to the boy. The one who's still waiting in the corner for me to wash his hands, but I cannot let him open this can of worms, go fishing for answers and skin that he will never swim. See, these waters are not safe. This boat is not safe. I don't want to be hooked another throwaway, another mad diary of a black woman alone in a room with no one who understands why the streets are wailing, why the air tastes like iron, why the ghost of Katrina will not leave us, why Mississippi is still burning, why the humidity in Ferguson drips like blood as New York concrete chokes on roses, caught in the cracks. They cannot breathe, we cannot breathe, I cannot breathe, so I become fire and burn smoke, billowing tower of civil disobedience, I become revolution. Was this country not built on revolution, on gunfire, on escape, on protest, on freedom, on the backs of black bodies, what ripped from black wounds? They call this the land of the free the home of the brave, the place of opportunity. They say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, black girl, but the ones I was given would not fit, so I made my own. I call them black women's lives matter. This is not your indictment. This is not your prosecution. Do not make me your conviction, because boy in the corner, I do not want, nor do I need your white guilty plea. When I say black women's lives matter, I am attempting to dig deep below the sorrow and the pain and the white supremacy. Find that seed that still exists. When I say white, black women's lives matter, what I am really saying is my black life matters. so much for that piece, Lupita. Next up, we're gonna have the story of Asada Shakur by Denisha. Asada Shakur, say her name. Asada Shakur. Asada Shakur was born and raised in New York City. In her early 20s, she would join the New York chapter of the Black Panther Party in 1971. During this time, she ran the Free Breakfast Program. It would also be in New York that she became involved in Pan-Africanism and formed a close friendship with Afini Shakur, the mother of Tupac Shakur. The two of them sometimes lived together in different apartments in the city. Shakur left the party soon after joining due to dealing with serious misogyny, including sexual harassment. She was also dissatisfied with the lack of emphasis of teaching black history, along with political education. Shakur then joined the Black Liberation Army, the underground organization affiliated with the Black Panther Party. Her true activities in the BLA aren't known. In, the 1973, in, in 1973, Asada Shakur was shot on New Jersey Turnpike by New Jersey State Troopers. The shooting was part of an effort to track her down after she was charged with killing New York police officers and committing robberies of armored cars and banks. Shakur would later be held in a series of men's prison in poor condition and denied rehabilitative care for her shooting injuries. During her time while being locked up with one of her comrades, she became pregnant with her only known child. She gave birth to her daughter while still incarcerated. She, she managed to escape prison and go to Cuba in 1979 she currently resides in Cuba under asylum. The federal government of the United States still considers her to be a threat and has placed her on the terrorist watch list with a $1 million bounty on her head. 
They don't have anything more important to do, apparently. <laughs> to this day, she continues to be an outspoken activist against state-sponsored violence by the United States government. Free Asada. Thank you for that, Denisha. Next up, we're going to have a piece by Jess Moni. Peace, everyone. See, my skin is black, and my arms are long, and my hair is woolly, and my back is strong, strong enough to Do they call me? I'll tear up. What do they call me? Sephronia. What do they call me? Sydney. What do they call me? I loved you hard that summer. When we rediscover what it means to be a woman, that all of our breasts do not all hang the same, but all of our backs have been used as bridges at one point in time. Our shoulders stay heavy with the world. I took your heart, wrapped it in silk fabric, placed it in the left back pocket of my favorite pair of jeans. Making sure not to sit too hard that you might break my seams. I carried all of your weight. And when you told me your arms felt too heavy, we would dance, shifted our feet, we were feathers in the wind swayed to vibrations from Cuba, deep Africa, Senegal. I take you home. Offer to wash off your sweat, but that musk would never leave your oils. Stain my pillow, I'd let your scent linger for as long as it needed to. You took up my space, and I didn't ask you to apologize for it. That is what you've been waiting for, and I provided, oh, how hard. I loved you that summer. I remembered your smile like sweet honeydew on Sunday afternoons and Earl Grey tea with milk. I even whispered prayers around your stretch marks, thinking that they were rosary beads, that it might heal you. Found myself mourning because not even the power of my words could heal rape, and not even the intensity of my touch could heal wounds. See you. You had diamonds falling from your lips. I knew there was a treasure chest attached to your spine that I tried to massage out, mistaking it for a knot that summer. You, you had jewels. Even in your bowel movements, everything you touched turned to sunrise. Girl, you were on fire. But I wanted to cut you out of that cocoon, to be selfish, to be upset that I had invested all of that time loving you that hard. I spent 90 days and nights with you on my back, rediscovering with you what it means to be black, reminding you that our bones will stop dancing just because they are left in ashes underneath oak trees and spectators to take glance. What it means to not hate men. What it means to love your mother. And what it means to not hate men, that not all of their eyes will dance around your thighs and lips aren't piercing enough to reopen stitch wounds left by other men. You have brothers that love you. What it means to be Asian, 
to know that your language is sacred and every time you speak in your native tongue you call upon indigenous spirits to surround you you will never be alone what it means to love fearlessly and to be comfortable with reservation i swear i tried to make this process easier but i was never good at keeping things from you see this this is for a colored girl who considers suicide every day. I loved myself hard that summer. Thank you so much, Moni. Just Moni, for that very powerful piece. So we're gonna have a little bit of an intermission A five minute intermission, and then we're going to get back on with stories of performance. Thank you. Yeah, so if anyone has something that they want to add. Left him high and dry, let him get fucking deep down with a baseball bat. He's got a steel plate in his head and had to suffer some seizures now. And you know those bastards in there and that party wanted to go. So we're going to hear some stories about um, black women survivors uh, um, uh, and, and black women impacted by state violence. Um, first, we're going to hear from yeah. AJ Johnson. So that's who you're fucking with. Okay. I'll be back. Tanisha Anderson, say that with me. Tanisha Anderson. Tanisha was 37 when her life was taken by the Cleveland police November 13, 2014. People described her as outgoing, silly, always joking. She was real giving and forgave a lot and believed in fighting for what's right. She was taking medication for mental health reasons, and family members say she just wasn't doing very well that day. They called the police in hopes they would transport her to the hospital for an evaluation. Tanisha became nervous in the confined space in the back of the police cruiser and tried to exit. A cop responded by using a takedown move slamming her face into the pavement, ultimately causing her death. She is survived by her 16-year-old daughter, Mavion Green, who will continue her mother's legacy by working for the conscientious treatment of the mentally ill. This is an all too common scenario where family members or friends feel forced to call the cops on someone experiencing a mental health crisis. Offer officers often use cruel and excessive force against the mentally and medically ill, killing the very person they were called to help. Hopefully, as a community, we can build alternatives to calling the police on someone experiencing a mental illness. Thanks, AJ. Next, we're going to hear a story from Raven Taylor. Ayana Stanley Jones. Say her name. Monet Stanley Jones was a seven-year-old girl from the east side of Detroit, Michigan, who was shot and killed during a raid conducted by the Detroit Police Department's Special Response Team on May 16, 2010. Ayanna was two months shy of her eighth birthday. In July, she would have had a birthday and her family would have enjoyed seeing her smile another year. Ayanna's grandmother, Mertilla, was home with the child when the police came searching for a relative who was wanted for an earlier crime. It was the police that came looking for a suspect, gun first, eyes second. The officer responsible for Ayanna's murder tried to blame it on her grandmother, stating that she grabbed the gun and caused the shooting, but her prints were not found on the weapon. The Detroit PD had the audacity to kill this girl and attempt to blame her grieving grandmother the murder of her own grandchild. And if that was not enough, 
when the officer who shot Diariana was not indicted for murder until one year later, and even then, Officer Joseph Weekly walked free five years later after two mistrials. The U.S. injustice system did not find anything unjust about an officer busting into a child's home and killing her in front of her family, while black people of her own community could spend years in prison for property crimes. We honor you, Ayana. We celebrate your place in this world. We celebrate each year that you lived and breathed and played and loved. Remember your smile, and we will continue with this fight for you, Ayana. Rest in power. Thank you. Now we're going to hear a story from Christy. Please say her name, Cece McDonald. Cece McDonald. Cece McDonald's story of coming into womanhood was like many trans women growing up in society. She had a face. She had to face violence from people in her community in Minneapolis, and even some of her family members. Despite all of this, she persevered and eventually lived in a chosen family of other queer and trans youth. In addition, she was studying fashion at the Minneapolis Community Technical College. During June 5, 2011, C.C. McDonald and her friends were attacked by white supremacist Dean Schmitz and his friends. C.C. defended herself by stabbing Schmitz in the chest, killing him, and she ended up with a gash on her face. Despite that fact, she was defending herself. She was wrongfully charged with second degree murder. She eventually pleaded guilty to second degree manslaughter in order to avoid spending the rest of her life in prison. She would serve 19 months in a men's prison despite women, despite being a woman. During this time, many, many people came to support the injustice of her being in prison. She continued to write about the imprisonment, mass incarceration, sexism, racism, transphobia, and other forms of oppression. CC was released on January the 13th, 2013. Today, she continues to organize and speak across the country about the injustices taking place in the United States. Last year, she was the main speaker at Trans Pride. There, she talked extensively about her story of wrongful incarceration and the need to fight for radical change in the system. Next, we're going to hear some poetry from Justine. I call this poem, You're Not Listening. Please, no one take offense to this. Stay silent and behind closed doors won't save you. Being passive about oppression makes you a slave too. You've been listening for too long to those corrupt soothsayers, manipulative community leaders and race traders, telling you to be peaceful and respectful to your enemies, who erase your existence and deny your humanity. Wake up and stop listening to those cropped up opportunists, nonprofit, political party backed liars who want to fool us. If you believe in assimilation, it's the same as liberation that the wealth and power will kill the situation we are facing. But you say the city's different, and opportunities abound, so why your ass still broke and damn near homeless in this town? Just like your grandparents, who lived there before you did, everyone with your skin color is going to raise a hopeless kid. Because when the people in power talk, they never mention our plight. Instead, they say the economy's growing, they're proclaiming false black flight. What's gonna happen when you become another statistic or end up dead from the circumstances that are quite suspicious? No answer, huh? I can't believe what they've done to you, making you feel insignificant because our numbers are so few. While we wait, while we make up the bulk of the poor, homeless and imprisoned, and you can call me crazy, but seems like ethnic cleansing is their mission. Then I tell you to get involved and fight for true justice via the streets, online, or any means that can bring substance to the hidden problems this passive aggressive place won't address. But you tell me, let's just sit and chill and talk our way out this mess. Knowing damn well commiserating with your oppressors ain't gonna change shit. 
It doesn't stop guns or fists, and it never stopped master's whips. Pleading and begging makes you weaker. Demand and liberate for the things we need, and fuck having to play. By their old-fashioned rules for making change that's gradual. Let's shut this shit down. Be a community with roots so radical. Hand in hand together, we can make these things a reality. I'll let us back up from hard times. We can do it any For now, we choose to stay in that closed world where you can find comfort in the pain of never truly being sure. If you'll live or die or suffer the existence for who you are, leading you, leading you to keep out anything that could ruin your faith in soulless laws. So you don't hear me though, and I don't see you know. We belong, because we belong to two different sides of a common goal. much, Justine. Next, we're going to hear a story from Dominique. Thank you. Lamia Bird, say her name. Lamia Bird was an incredible singer who drew me grew up singing at funerals and weddings in her community. She is remembered by friends and family as a very smart woman who spoke, who spoke French, who played instruments, and dreamed of using her gifts as a music teacher. A family friend described Lamia's struggle as a transgender woman in Virginia, how, quote, discouraged she would get about applying for different jobs. Lamia just wanted people to accept her for who she was. Lamia was no stranger to the fight. Me, no stranger to the fight for her humanity. After being denied a driver's license picture, as she was, for a form of state-sponsored transphobia, Lamia went back to the DMV until she got her driver's license picture, makeup and all. On January 17, 27, turning 15, excuse me, Lamia was fatally shot. After which, after which the media made cruel attempts to tarnish her name and caused her family to fear that Lamia would soon be forgotten and seen as unimportant. But tonight, we honor you, sister. We love you, Lamia. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to give a shout out to Revolution Staging for providing sound for free. Thank you. Up next, we're going to hear a, a personal story, a personal story of survival from Salam. Okay. I titled this Survival, May 15th. I was wearing this exact outfit down to the shirt, the sweatshirt, the underwear, the socks, the shoes, May 15th, 2015. On this day, outside of Myrtle Beach, Beacon Hill, I was assaulted. It was mostly a game. There was a candlelight vigil. I was there for solidarity. I flashed Black Pride, followed by a peace sign. I don't know what I did. There were roughly 60 to 100 people. I was being followed by eight people. I walked to the bus stop. On my way to my friend's home, I was assaulted. Eight people were following me. I walked past the bus stop. Eight people were following me. That's all I remember. I was wearing headphones at the time, listening to music. I was hitting my right ear. And all I wanted to do was show solidarity. And I don't know what community is. I look for community in all people. I see a group of roughly 120 people. I don't know what that means. All I know is, all I know is survival. 20 people, 100 hits, 60 hits. What is that? Twitter, hashtag, at Salambabuni. I don't know. What is survival? Survival is peace. What is peace? Peace 
is action. What is action? Action is sound. What is sound? Sound are boards. Now, sound boards. I survive. I have staples in my head to prove it. Seven. Seven is a lucky number. I don't know when to stop. Now, take a moment. Pause. We are at a memorial. People have died. People die every day. We need to remember all of this. All of this. All of these faces. All of these black women. Black women's lives matter. Every black woman matters. Every black person matters. Every person here matters today. Survive. Thank you so much, Salam. We will now hold our ceremonial ceremonial lighting of the candles as we speak the names of 55 black women whose lives have been lost to state violence as well as black women survivors of state violence. They are just a few of many. These candles represent the light and the power that live in all black women. What they're going to do when they read a name, they're going to read the name and then say, say her name, and then if you'll repeat the name. Um, and we have Jazzy and Al, all the way from Western Washington University, helping us read names today. So I'll let y'all take it away. Lamia Bird, say her name. Proud, say her name. Ty Underwood, say her name. Yasmin Bash Payne, say her name. Deshauna Sanchez, say her name. Anya Parker, say her name. Tanisha Anderson, say her name. Annette Smith. Say her name. Miriam Carey. Say her name. Shelly Fry. Say her name. Darnisha Diana Harris. Say her name. Melissa Williams. Say her name. Melissa Thomas. Say her name. Chantel Davis, say her name. Sharice Francis, say her name. Anya Sh Sh <clears throat> Stanley Jones, say her name. Sharika Wilson, Wilson, say her name. Katherine Johnson, say her name. Alberta Spuriel, say her name. Boyd, say her name. Natasha McKenna, say her name. Tisha Miller, say her name. Charmel Edwards, say her name. Renisha McBride, say her name. Kendra James, say her name. Alexa Christian, say your name. Megan Cockadoo, say her name. Lisa Fonville, say her name. Laura Rosser, say your name. Eleanor Bumpers, say your name. Adisha Miller. Say your name. Alicia, Alicia Thomas, say your name. Alicia Thomas. Darnisha Harris, say your name. Darnisha Harris. Delora Epps, say your name. Delora Epps. Erica Collins, say her name. Erica Collins. Heather Parker, say her name. Heather Parker. Jacqueline Colt, say your name. Karen Day, say her name. LaPorsha Watson, say her name. Kayla Ross, say her name. 
Curly Golden, say her name. Robin T. Williams, say her name. Shelly Faye, say her name. Shaluna S. Golden, say her name. Gabriela Navarez, say her name. Ashe. Uh, I'm Mara. I'm going to read off some of the names uh, of survivors of state violence. And yeah, Harris. Ashe. Durden could not make it um, in time, but we did want to take um, some time to honor her story. Um, you know, it happened right here in Seattle. Um, her her faith basically was broken by the Seattle Police Department, and um, there's currently a case about it um, about it against the Seattle Police Department, and you know that just reminds us what we're living with, that this could happen um, to Coco in our own city, and where's the noise? So, you know, we just want to take a moment to honor Coco, to honor Salam and everybody um, whose stories were shared. Thank you. I just want to thank everyone so much for coming here. Um, hearing about Coco's story and other, there have been, um, there are two young men, if those of you who don't know, um, who were shot by the Olympia police today, who are in the hospital, um, because they were suspected of stealing beer. Um, another man was shot in Lakewood last month, and um, we've been doing a lot of actions, which is really powerful here, in solidarity with other places, but I want to um, just bring attention to the fact that Obviously, we're all struggling under the same system of oppression and state terrorism against our bodies. And I'm really happy to see all of you today and hope that we continue this movement and continue to grow and um, stand up together for each other because they don't give a fuck about us. Yeah, I just want to echo Bana, thank you so much for being here today. And also thank you for everyone who was a part of putting this together right here. Give them a hand. Thank you to all the performers and the speakers who blessed us tonight. Um, I hope you all travel home safely. To all the black women, I would like to deliver you a special message from Asada Shakur. Sisters, black people will never be free unless black women participate in every aspect of our struggle, on every level of our struggle. Ashe and at night.